Hey everyone, it's Kelsey and welcome back to my channel. In today's video, as you could tell by the title of the video, I'm going to be going over the Andrew Cunanan murders. I first came across this case by watching clips of the FX original series, American Crime Story, The Assassination of Gianni Versace, which encouraged me to do further research into the case, so I thought I'd share my findings with you guys. As you could tell by the title of the series, Gianni Versace, who was a world-known fashion designer, was unfortunately one of the victims of Andrew Cunanan. In today's video, I'm going to be going over Andrew Cunanan's victims and the events that led up to Andrew Cunanan's infamous killing spree that occurred in 1997. If you're only interested in the timeline of the murders, I'll leave a timestamp in the description below so you could skip the backstory and just get into the timeline of the murders. Anyways, let's get right into the case. Andrew Philip Cunanan was born August 31st, 1969 to his mother Mary Ann Shalachi, and I hope I'm pronouncing that right, and his father Modesto Cunanan, who would also go by Pete. Andrew was the youngest of four children, and something that's pretty interesting that I like to note is how Mary Ann, Andrew's mother, was hospitalized for three months after giving birth to Andrew Cunanan due to postpartum depression. So Modesto Cunanan actually came from the Philippines to serve in the U.S. Navy. The first half of Andrew's childhood, they actually lived in one of the poorest cities in America known as National City. In 1972, Modesto Cunanan retired from the Navy and got a job as a stockbroker. When Andrew was nine, the Cunanan family moved to a new neighborhood called Bonita in California, which was actually a very wealthy neighborhood. This move had Andrew in awe of the type of lifestyle that his neighbors had around him. Nice bags, nice shoes, just nice designer items and cars and just a nice lifestyle and he really admired that and wanted a lifestyle like that of his own. As a teen, the Cunanan family relocated once again to another wealthy neighborhood in California called Rancho Bernardo. Despite being the youngest of four kids, Modesto Cunanan and Andrew's dad actually paid the most attention to Andrew. They both shared interests in the finer things in life and Andrew actually got the master bedroom in this new house and he even got a car before he could even drive. So that's kind of bizarre. He was beyond spoiled and beyond pampered, just on another level. For high school, Andrew's parents managed to get him into one of the most exclusive private schools in this area, known as the Bishop School. This school's tuition was $9,000 a year. In this school, Andrew was attending school with the most elite, high-class, students. Now you can just imagine with how Andrew was brought up, he really felt at home in this fancy high school with these fancy students all around him just feeling nice and rich. So now let's get into Andrew's personality. So a lot of his friends described him as very charismatic, charming, loving type of friend. He would welcome everyone with a hug and a kiss and he was just very nice type of person to be around. But on the other spectrum, people who knew Andrew a lot more knew that he was really attention hungry type of person and he was a really status conscious person. So he did anything that he could to get people's attention that was always his goal, to get the people's attention, to make a scene, to just be known, to have his name known, and that is kind of what he achieves. Because in his senior year, he was actually voted as most likely to be remembered. So he kind of did achieve that goal in making a scene and making himself noticed and recognized. But a lot of his friends describe his personality as just an act. In fact, one of his friends believes that 90% of what came out of Andrew, even down to Andrew's homosexuality, was just made up for attention. Like I said earlier, in Andrew's senior year of high school, which was 1987, he was voted most likely to be remembered. Now, something I find really eerie about Andrew's senior quote or senior paragraph, so each student had about a paragraph to write next to their face. But Andrew only had one quote and it translated to, after me, the storm. And I think this is really eerie after knowing what happens 10 years after he graduated from high school. It's just super freaky. I don't know. I just thought that was interesting to note. After high school, Andrew attends the University of California in San Diego. In 1988, Andrew's life sort of went into shambles due to his father, Modesto Cunanan, having a warrant out for his arrest due to embezzlement. So Modesto Cunanan had to flee the country and went back to the Philippines to prevent himself from getting arrested in the States. This resulted in Andrew's mother having to rely on food stamps and Andrew obviously had to quit university due to lack of being able to 
afford it. After his life was falling apart in the States, Andrew decided to give his dad a visit in the Philippines. But Modesto's lifestyle could not compare to the lifestyle that Andrew was raised to praise. Disgusted by his dad's living conditions, Andrew moved back to the States and began to create a life of his own in the gay scene in San Diego, California. At this point in his life, Andrew was essentially an escort. He would spend some time with a man and that man would support him and his needs, give him a monthly allowance, and he would move on to a next man and so on and so on. At this point in his life, Andrew was also going by a different name. He was not going by Andrew Cunanan, he was going by Andrew Da Silva. He would even make up stories of his life and his family. He would say he had a rich family or he would say he had a daughter and a wife and he would even show pictures to support these lies of his. At around 23 or 24 years old, which was 1992 or 1993, Andrew Cunanan would meet a man by the name of Jeffrey Trails, who would soon become one of Andrew's best friends. Jeff Trail was serving as a Navy cruiser docked in San Diego at the time of meeting Andrew. Jeff's main struggle with his homosexuality was the fact that he was serving in the Navy where homosexuality was forbidden. For people who are not aware or are not from the States, the US military had a don't ask, don't tell policy, which applied to LGBTQ members who served in military services. This policy was first issued in 1993 and finally got lifted in 2011. In 1993, Jeff Trail actually went on a 48 hour interview to speak about the don't ask, don't tell policy and how it felt as a gay man serving in the U.S. Navy at the time. The effect of the ban being lifted is you maintain a quality Navy, you increase the quality of the Navy by not removing homosexuals. He obviously had to do this interview anonymously so he could protect his position in the U.S. Navy. Nothing I would like more than then to be, you know, lit up and tell you who I am and show you who I am, but I'm not allowed to do that. It's comfortable for me because I know I'll be able to continue to serve my country and do my job and do it right. It's also believed that when this video was taking place, this is around the time when Andrew and Jeff actually met. Jeff's involvement in the military forced him to live a discreet life as a gay man. So when he met Andrew, who is really in awe of Andrew's flamboyancy and how outgoing he was as a homosexual man. So there are actually conflicting reports on whether Andrew and Jeff's relationship was completely platonic or if there was some sort of romance involved. Most sources say that they were completely platonic, they were only friends, they had only ever been friends and nothing more, but some do mention some sort of romance, but given by the sources, I think they were more just platonic just completely friends. Jeff's sister actually does mention how Andrew was really weird around Jeff. Andrew had this weird obsession with Jeff and I quote, and I'm gonna read this straight off the quote, which is, when Jeff went to San Francisco and got a certain style of baseball cap, Andrew had to go to San Francisco and get the same baseball cap. When Jeff grew a goatee, Andrew would grow a goatee. So obviously that is really weird, that's really bizarre, it's such a weird, strange fascination that Andrew had towards Jeff. I mean, that's like so bizarre and I don't know how Jeff thought that was okay. Maybe he didn't and didn't say anything, but anyways, that's just so bizarre. Something else I find really bizarre is just how extra Andrew would go to make himself look like he was high class and rich and wealthy, which he obviously wasn't, and he would even go far enough to make Jeff look like he was also wealthy. So he would buy two pairs, let's say two pairs of shoes. He would buy two pairs of shoes, wrap one up to make it look like a gift, and then he would give both to Jeff and he would say, wear these and then come to a party and give me the other one. So he would make Jeff look like he was wealthy too and Andrew just wanted this big scene of his wealthy friend, his wealthy friend giving him a nice wealthy gift. That's so extra and just ridiculous. But anyways, it seemed like keeping up with Andrew's facade that he had this high class lifestyle got a bit exhausting for Jeff and that's when he kind of stepped back from Andrew. Before this, when Jeff's family would question Andrew to Jeff, he would always just brush off Andrew's weird behaviors with saying that Andrew was like family and sometimes you just gotta put up with them. Like when you put up with your brother or sister, that's what he felt like to Andrew. 
It's even reported that both Andrew and Jeff would refer to each other as brothers or brother-like figures. So you can really tell they had a close bond and they both cared for each other like family. In 1995, Andrew was at dinner in San Francisco with some friends when he noticed a man sitting alone at a bar. Andrew decided to send this man a drink and invite him over to his table. This was the moment that Andrew Cunanan met David Manson. After the dinner, Andrew invited David to the Mandarin Oriental where Andrew had been staying at the time. During this period of time, Andrew was being supported by Norman Blanchard who was a retired billionaire and Blanchard would actually give Andrew a monthly allowance of $2,000. So now let's get into knowing a little bit about David Manson. David Manson was a 33-year-old successful architect from Minneapolis, Minnesota. He was known as an extremely charming, charismatic, hardworking man with a great work ethic. Andrew and David ended up dating long distance for about a year. Andrew actually referred to David as the love of his life, but David didn't really know anything about Andrew. Andrew never told David where he lived. He never gave him a phone number. He would always change the numbers. He just was so sketchy and so obviously sketchy and David knew something was up, something wasn't right. But Andrew would reason all of these strange behaviors by saying that he had to keep a low profile and constantly change his address and number due to protecting his high class rich family. Um, so yeah, that was his excuse for everything and obviously at one point David had enough of these weird stories and lies. David and Andrew's relationship ended in September of 1996. This is also around the time when Jeff was moving to Minneapolis for a new job that he got as a district manager at a propane company. So Jeff called his good buddy Andrew up and he said, hey, I'm moving to this new city in this new town where I don't know anyone and I'm kind of nervous. And that's when Andrew introduced Jeff to David. And this is where Jeff and David meet. It's reported that Andrew actually proposed to David in February of 1997, which is a few months after they broke up which is so strange. David obviously denied the proposal and Andrew just kept coming back to David and begging him to take him back. And at this point, David was dating other men. And while he was dating other men, Andrew would just barge in and just be such an inconvenience. Imagine how uncomfortable that is. Like you're dating someone and then your ex comes in. It's just... He was so strange and just so persistent to another level. It's reported that Andrew would show up to David's apartment unannounced and would obviously make David so uncomfortable. Though so David went on to date other men, Andrew would continue to pursue David and he would intervene on his dating life which would obviously upset David and the men that he was dating. On April 25th, 1997, Andrew landed in Minneapolis, Minnesota to visit his two best friends, Jeffrey Trail and David Manson, for what would be the last time. According to witnesses, Andrew's reason for this trip was to settle some business which is really disturbing after knowing what occurs on this trip. At this point, David and Jeff were really over Andrew's visits. They were more of an inconvenience than anything. They were just over it. But of course, being the kind person he was, David let Andrew stay at his apartment with him during this trip. Andrew spent his first night in Minneapolis at David's apartment. During this trip, Andrew went out with David and his friends to dinner and a club. On Andrew's second night, Andrew spent the night at Jeff's apartment while he was out of town. Now Jeff actually owned a handgun and at some point, whether it was the night that he stayed at his apartment or sometime before that, um, Andrew got a hold of this handgun. And that will tie in later into the story. On Andrew's third night in Minneapolis, which was April 27th, 1997, Andrew invited Jeff over to David's apartment. Exact details on what happened in the apartment are unknown, but neighbors reported hearing a loud thud and someone yell, get the hell out. The next morning, Andrew and David were both witnessed walking Andrew's dog, Prince. Witnesses say they just looked really calm like anyone looks when you're walking your dog. On April 29th, 1997, police showed up to David's apartment after receiving a concerned call from David's employers that he did not show up to work. Police discovered Jeffrey Trail's body rolled up in a carpet with wounds to the head. Upon further investigation, it was discovered that Jeffrey Trail 
was bashed in the head approximately 27 times with a claw hammer as the murder weapon. Initially, police suspected that David was the killer, but on May 3rd, 1997, David Manson's body was found near East Rush Lake. David Manson was found shot to the head, execution style, with Jeffrey Trail's handgun as the murder weapon. Now let's backtrack a bit to the night of Jeff's murder because I know that was a lot of facts thrown at you and more so how the information was found, but let's just backtrack to gather all the information together for further explanation. So Andrew shows up to David's apartment and he is beaten with a hammer approximately 27 times by Andrew Cunanan. Now the FX original series shows David's character being a witness to Jeffrey Trail's murder. But in reality, it is not known whether David was in his apartment at the time that the murder was taking place or not. David's family actually believes and insists that David was not in his residence during the time the murder was taking place. They believe that David showed up to his apartment to find Jeffrey Trail's body laying in his apartment. And that is when Andrew took David as a hostage by fear and restraints. After the murder, as we said earlier, the next day Andrew and David were witness walking David's dog Prince and after that it is believed that they stayed in David's apartment for two days and when the police came to knock at David's door they fleed and they like took a back exit or something and they started to drive off. And then the next instant that we hear about David is that his body was found near East Rush Lake on May 3rd, 1997. After killing David, Andrew takes David's red jeep and heads to Chicago. And on May 4th, 1997, Chicago real estate mogul Lee Miglin was found murdered in the garage of his house. The book that the FX original series is based on, which is called Vulgar Favors, actually quotes this about Lee Miglin's death, and I'm just going to read it word for word. Except one graphic excerpt that I'm going to exclude from the quote because I just don't think it's necessary to state in this video. If you're not comfortable hearing this because it is pretty graphic, even though I am taking a graphic detail out of it, you can totally skip this, and I'll leave a timestamp below to skip this specific specific quote. So Vulgar favors the book, quotes, Lee Miglin's ankles were bound with an orange extension cord wrapped tightly around eight times and tied with a double knot. His mouth was gagged with a garden glove and there were over two dozen blows causing bruises or laceration to his head, face, and chin. Masking tape had been wound around his head mummy style, left with an opening at the nostrils and at the top of his head. Gay pornographic magazines had been left near the scene. At first, this murder was believed to just have been done by robbers or gangsters or something like that, done by people who did not know Meglin personally. Later on, Meglin's death was tied to the Andrew Cunanan murders, so that's how they kind of linked it together. It is believed that Andrew stayed in Miglin's residence after committing the murder. It is believed that he took a shower, shaved his beard, and ate some ham because he left like a huge slice of ham on Lee Miglin's desk. After Lee Miglin's murder, Andrew steals Miglin's car, which was a Lexus. And this Lexus actually had GPS due to the built-in phone that it had inside it. But the only way that you can activate the GPS was if the phone were to be used. And for about two days, the phone was not used. So police were just waiting around for Andrew to use the built-in phone in the car so they can locate his location. So at this point, Andrew heads to the East Coast and lands in New York. In New York, Andrew registered himself in a gay bathhouse and even watched a Broadway show at the Chelsea Theater. On May 8th, Lee Miglin's car phone was activated and located near southern New Jersey. But when Andrew heard news reports that they could track the car, he had to ditch the car as soon as he could. So on May 9th, Andrew pulled over at a nearby cemetery in Pennsville, New Jersey. At the cemetery, Andrew shot and killed William Reese, who was the cemetery's caretaker at the time. Andrew stole the red truck of William Reese and headed south to Miami, Florida. William Reese, Andrew's fourth victim, was just a innocent bystander who just happened to be a crime of opportunity. He was not linked to Andrew. He didn't know anything about Andrew. 
he was just there and Andrew took the opportunity to kill him for his truck. Andrew managed to stay unnoticed while using the stolen vehicle by changing the license plate of the truck. So he would steal other license plates and put it on his truck. On June 12th, 1997, Andrew Cunanan was added to the FBI's 10 most wanted list. In Miami, Florida, Andrew was staying in the Normandy Plaza Hotel, which was only a six-minute walking distance from the Versace mansion where Gianni Versace lived. On July 7th, Andrew sold a gold coin to a local pawn shop in order to pay for his room he was staying in. According to state law, pawn shop owners are required to send records of all the transactions that occur in the pawn shop, which is exactly what this pawn shop owner did. Andrew showed this pawn shop owner his proof of identity by passport and even signed some papers under his legal name. On July 8th, the pawn shop owner sent Andrew's information over to the police and no one had noticed. This was a name in the FBI's 10 most wanted list and no one noticed. This absolutely blows my mind because if someone noticed his name on these papers, realized where he was staying, they could have arrested him on the spot. This last victim could have been completely avoided and everything could have ended, but that is not the case. That is not what happened. His papers just went unnoticed. Eight days later, on July 15th, 1997, Gianni Versace was returning to his house from his morning walk when he was shot twice in the head on the steps of his house. Versace was pronounced dead at the hospital a short while later. After Versace's murder, Andrew was on the run and had to find a place of hiding. About a week after Gianni Versace's killing, a caretaker of a houseboat noticed there was an intruder and immediately called the police. Police arrived at the scene and engaged in a five-hour standoff. Once police finally entered the houseboat, they found Andrew Cunanan lying on a bed with a self-inflicted gunshot wound to the head. Andrew's body was lying on a bed, only wearing his underwear with the gun still in his hand. Alright guys, so that is it for all the facts that this case entails. I hope you enjoyed watching this video. This is my first type of true crime case. So if you have any suggestions on how I formatted it or how I edited it to make it better, um, leave me in the comments below and give me a thumbs up or thumbs down if you liked it or just give me some feedback because I'd really, really appreciate it because I've worked hard on this video. But I'd like to know if you guys enjoyed watching it or not. But anyways, that is it for this video. Let me know as well if there's other true crime cases or other just cases in general that you'd like to see me cover. Anyways, you guys, that's it for this video. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you all next time. Bye!